Um, as we've been journeying through this gratitude series, we've tried to give lots of opportunities to express our gratitude. Uh, we have um, gratitude journals. We, we handed those out in the first week. If you didn't get one, I um, encourage you, that they're out in the lobby here. You can, um, on your uh, bulletin, there's a little QR code to get a digital version. But every day is a, a little prompt to help you reflect on um, an aspect of gratitude. And then there's an action step to do. Yesterday's action step was to thank a veteran. So if you didn't do that yesterday, you can check that off. You just did that. Good job. Um, but uh, it's a great tool to, to do. Um, last week, um, we passed out postcards just to give you a way to intentionally just write out a thank you to express your gratitude to somebody. And that's one of the things that we've been trying to communicate with this series. Luke talked a lot about it the first two weeks, that gratitude isn't a feeling, it's an action, right? We express our gratitude. We, we communicate in different ways that we're thankful um, for, for people, thankful for what they've done, thankful for different situations. And Luke talked about how, um, how unexpressed gratitude is really ingratitude. If you, you, you can think it, but if you don't take the time to communicate it, to express it, then the other person doesn't know, right? And expressing that gratitude is, is important. It's powerful. Um, and it also has a big impact. Gratitude is a, a powerful thing, right? It, gratitude actually has an impact on, on you, like the way you think in your brain. There's been studies that show that as you express gratitude, it actually releases dopamine in your brain. That's kind of the feel-good chemical. You can, you can feel better about yourself and about situations as you intentionally express gratitude. Um, expressing gratitude lowers stress and anxiety. So in doing those intentional acts actually improves your mental health. But more than that, it, it strengthens relationships, right? So as you intentionally express gratitude, you're gonna have stronger relationships. So your marriage is gonna be stronger when each spouse is intentional about expressing gratitude for each other. Parents and kids, those relationships are gonna be stronger when you take time to intentionally express gratitude, to call out the things that you're thankful for, the things that you see in them, um, the things that they, they've done. Call that out and acknowledge that. Friendships are stronger, right? Think about the impact on our community, if we all are more intentional about expressing gratitude, those relationships are strengthened. It has power, it has impact. Now, a lot of times when we think about gratitude, we think about gratitude as just this response to something good that's happened to us, right? A good situation or somebody's given us something or have done something for us. And, and we know like, okay, that's a response. We should give gratitude. But what's interesting, as you read through the Bible, the Bible talks about gratitude in a whole other level. It's not just a response to something good. The Bible talks about gratitude more as, more as a posture of your heart. Right? It's a, a posture of your, your heart. And so as you read through, there, there's um, a lot of uh, gratitude or thanksgiving is talked about a lot in the New Testament, especially the Apostle Paul. And Paul has uh, written a bunch of letters to different churches in the first century, and those have been collected, and they make up a big chunk of our New Testament. And Paul, as he writes these letters to these churches, um, over and over again, he mentions this idea of, of gratitude, of thanksgiving, of, of giving thanks. But when he expresses it, the way he talks about it is interesting, because he uses a certain type of word in association with thanksgiving that, that if I'm honest, makes me a little uncomfortable, because it gets to this idea of like this bigger picture of gratitude. Let me share a couple of these with you. Uh, the first one is uh, First, Theth First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, chapter five, eighteen. He says this. He says, "Be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus." So he talks about gratitude. But he uses this word "all." Interesting. Uh, another place, Ephesians 5, verse 20, he says this. He says, give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Philippians, Philippians 4, he says this. He says, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. All, every, everything. Now, wait a minute, like, we should give thanks in, for everything, for all the circumstances? Like, I, I, can, I can be thankful, I can give thanks for my dog, I have a really good dog, but I, I ain't thanking God for mosquitoes. Those things are evil. 
right? But yet Paul's like, hey, everything, give thanks for everything to, to God. I know that's kind of like a silly thing, but what about the difficult circumstances in our lives? Because I, I've talked to many of you, and I know some of you right now are in the midst of some incredibly difficult circumstances. You are facing challenging battles, battles with your health. Some of you are facing battles in your relationships. Some of you are facing battles with addiction. Some of you are facing battles in, in a job situation. And I know you are facing some incredibly difficult circumstances. What about in those situations? The all, the every, the everything. Does that include that? Like how, how are we supposed to think about gratitude in, in, regards, in regards to that? All, every, everything. And, and maybe if you're in the midst of a difficult circumstance and you hear some of those things, like that's not always good news. Sometimes it's like, I don't get this. So what's Paul getting at? That's what I want to talk about today, about what does it look like to have gratitude in the face of, of difficult circumstances. So to talk about that, let me set that up um, by talking a little bit about the science of light, all right? Light, here's what you need to know about light. Light helps us see things. (sighs) Thank you, thank you. Yes, Brent, oh, you're a regular Bill Nye, right? You're so good, Brent. No, light helps us see things, right? Light helps us perceive the reality around us. Right? The reason you can see me on the stage is because light waves are traveling through, they're bouncing off me, and then they're going into your eyes and your brain interprets those signals and you perceive the reality around you. Right? All, all of the beautiful colors around, right? as earlier this month, as the leaves are changing to all these beautiful colors, you're able to see those colors because certain light waves are absorbed and other light waves were reflected and you're able to perceive the reality around you. Light helps us see what's true, what, what's reality around us. Now, what's interesting, though, is that visible light, what we perceive with our eyes, is actually just a very, very small sliver of something called the electromagnetic spectrum, right? The electromagnetic spectrum. I told you we're getting all science up here today, okay? Right? So um, just on either side of visible light is uh, you have uh, infrared light and you have ultraviolet light, right? So we, we don't perceive the world in those ways, but that um, exists. There are some animals that perceive the world in that way. So like bees see the world in ultraviolet light. Uh, And if you were to talk to a bee and have them describe a daisy, what the the flower the bee would describe would be totally different than what you would describe because bees see the world in ultraviolet light. They see a whole different reality than we can perceive with our own eyes. Or infrared, snakes sense the world in infrared. That's why they're able to hunt in the darkness of night and find that, you know, furry little mouse and have it for lunch. Um, because it senses the world in a different way than, than we sense. And, and, then, and then there's all the other aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum. You know, on, on one end, you have, um, you have like the X-rays, you know, which is great if you break a bone. And then you have uh, gamma rays, which turn Bruce Banner into the Hulk, right? Stay away from those unless you want to smash something. And then by all means, you know, go for it. Um, you have uh, microwaves, which we all should be thankful for, that we don't have to wait forever for food to cook. Like we just put that popcorn in and we're ready to watch the movie in a couple of minutes. It's great. Um, radio waves, all of that, all those waves are part of this broader electromagnetic spectrum. But here's the interesting thing. Humanity for thousands and thousands and thousands of years had no idea any of that even existed because all we could see was the reality that we could perceive just in the visible light. It wasn't until about 1800 that infrared light was discovered, 1801 ultraviolet light, and then years and decades later, those other um, aspects of the electromagnetic spectrum were discovered. And now we have tools and technologies that we are able to see those things, perceive those aspects of reality, and also interact with them and use them to our benefit. But for the most of humanity, we didn't even realize that was a reality that existed. So I say all of that about light to maybe propose this. When you're facing difficult circumstances, it's easy for that to be all that you can see. But maybe there are realities around you that you can't perceive. Just because you can't see something doesn't mean it isn't true or doesn't exist. And so one of the unique things about our brain, the ways our brains are wired 
is that anytime we come across a perceived threat, our brains focus in on that threat, right? So when we face a difficult circumstance, our brains focus in on that. And it's actually a good thing. It's a good thing your brains are wired that way. You know, if you're out in the woods, you're hiking along, and this mountain lion comes after you, you want all of your brain focused on that moment. You don't want to be thinking about other things, right? Like you need to be focused on that perceived threat. But it's not as helpful when it's long-term situational things like grief and stress and anxiety. But yet our brains interpret those difficult circumstances as a perceived threat, and we become hyper-focused on those things to where that's the only thing that we can see, right? And we get so focused, and so the difficult circumstance in front of you consumes your thoughts It consumes your mind. You get stuck in these negative thoughts that just over and over again play the same tapes and the what ifs and the worries and the stress and the anxiety. Anybody with me? Anybody ever experienced that? Maybe you're in the midst of that right now. And we can get stuck there. And that's all we see. But maybe, just like we talked about with light, maybe there's a reality beyond that that we can't perceive. And just because we can't see it doesn't mean it isn't there. And so what would maybe one of these realities be that sometimes we can't see, sometimes we miss if we're just focused on our difficult circumstances? What what is maybe one of those? Well, I think Paul gives us a hint um, in the scripture. And this is back to this verse we read earlier. We're going to expand it to a few other verses in Philippians chapter 4. And Paul, as he's writing this, he's actually in prison. Paul writes the letter to the Philippians while he is in jail for preaching the gospel. So Paul is facing his own difficult circumstance, right? Paul is in the midst of a very difficult circumstance, yet he writes these words. Listen to what he says, Philippians 4, starting with verse 4. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. There's another one of those words. Always? Really? Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So Paul, in the midst of his own difficult circumstance, is able to say, hey, rejoice always. In every situation, give thanks. So how is Paul able to say that? Maybe he's aware of a reality that sometimes we miss. And I think the clue to that truth is four little words in the middle of the verses we just read. When Paul says, the Lord is near. The Lord is near. How how am I able to rejoice always? How am I in every situation, in all circumstances, how am I able to give thanksgiving? The Lord is near. God is with you. In the midst of the difficult circumstances you face, God hasn't abandoned you. He's not turned his back on you. God is with you in the midst of that. Yet sometimes we miss it because we get so focused. I think God's wanting to open our eyes and say, hey, I am here with you. I'm walking with you. I'm grieving with you. I'm carrying you through. I'm giving you the strength to face difficult moment after difficult moment to see you through. The Lord is near. God is with you. And that truth, that reality is something that we can give thanks for. That's something that we can rejoice even in the midst of those difficult circumstances. God is with us. It's an incredible, incredible truth. Now, sometimes we lose sight of that reality. So, we need a couple of practices or a couple of tools to help us see the reality we can't perceive, right? So in the same way with light, we had to create these tools or technologies to help us perceive the infrared or ultraviolet light or the other aspects of that. So today I want to talk about two practices the Bible gives us to help us perceive reality, to help us see the truth that God is with us even when we don't see it, even when we don't feel it, even when we don't sense it. Two, two practices, two tools. The first one is the practice of gratitude. Big surprise, we're in the middle of the series talking about gratitude. But I want to talk about gratitude 
not as just this polite response when something good happens to us. Gratitude is an intentional practice. It takes effort. It takes intentionality to, in the midst of your difficult circumstances, to look around and say, okay, what can I give thanks for? And then the, the actual act of naming and calling out and expressing that gratitude is a perspective shifter. It resets your brain to help you see things that maybe you can't see in, in the midst of it. And so biblical gratitude isn't just some polite response. Biblical gratitude is a posture of the heart. It's a practice that is rich and deep enough to be able to express it even in the midst of our difficult circumstances, not minimizing what we're going through, not ignoring what you're facing, but realizing there's, there's maybe parts that you can't see. So um, a couple of stories, one's kind of superficial, one's um, a little more meaningful. But um, So the superficial one, uh, about three weeks, three, four weeks ago was fall break. And uh, so the boys and my wife were on break and I was able to take a week of vacation off and we were gonna take a trip camping. We decided we were gonna go to Hawking Hill State Park in Ohio. We'd never been there before. We were excited to go camping. We love to just be out in nature and do those kind of things. And so um, on, um, hauling our little camper there would be about a five hour drive. And so I wanted to get an early start. I was like, hey, we gotta get everything packed. We gotta get ready. I wanna leave early to avoid traffic and that way we don't have to set up in the dark and we can make the most of the, the daylight that we have. And so, you know, that morning comes and I'm like cracking the whip, you know, to the kids. Like, come on, get ready, get your stuff packed. We gotta leave, let's go, let's go, let's go. So we get things packed and then I, I go, I hop in the truck to hook it up to the camper and nothing, dead battery. I'm like, ugh. So I get out, I try to charge the battery. It doesn't hold a charge, the battery's dead. I'm like, come on. So I hop on the phone, I call a couple different stores, finally find a store that has the battery I need and I hop in our van and driving into town to get the battery. And I'm just like, you know, you know how you get in those negative thought cycles. I'm just like, ah, oh, of all the days for the battery to die, why is it today we're gonna get a late start and we're gonna get caught in traffic. We're gonna set up in the dark. We're wasting our whole evening, you know, just like, da, 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 da. and then I, then I stopped and, and I had this thought. Well, at least the battery died when I was at home and we had our other vehicle versus if it could have, it could have died in the campground where we had no cell signal and that was our only vehicle. Like at least that happened. And as I'm driving, I thought, well, and at least like we live at a place where there's actually stores that have the battery in stock. Like I could be waiting for days for the battery to be delivered, but I can just, I can get it. That's not too bad. And, and I'm like, and you know, it's only gonna take maybe an hour or so to like get everything swapped over with drive time. And that's not too bad. Like we still get to go camping. Like we still get to experience our trip, you know? And, and I was just able to name, even, even though it wasn't a great situation and it didn't work out like I wanted, I still was able to name things that were still true that I could be thankful for. And, and I tell you, like, that, that perspective shift happened in my mind, right? And I, I kind of, like, quit, like, in that negative thought cycle, and I was like, okay, it's, this, this will be okay, right? It'll, it'll work out. Now, I wish I could say, like, my, my mind stayed that way the rest of the day. There still were moments in the day where, you know, I had to fight back those negative thoughts. But, um, man, gratitude has the power to just reset your brain, and help you see things maybe in a different perspective. And, you know, that's kind of superficial. It's just, you know, dead battery on a truck, not a big deal. But I was having lunch the other week with uh, a good friend, and he was talking about the difficult circumstance that he's facing. And he was just talking about how just in the midst of this really challenging time, he got another round of bad news. And he just talked about how his thoughts and his mind kind of went to that negative, depressed state that it's so easy to get into those thought cycles. And he felt himself going there and he said, no, I don't wanna go there. So he said he pulled out a piece of paper and he started just writing down the names of everybody that reached out to him in that season. Anybody that sent a text or a call or talked to him and said, hey, praying for you, thinking about you, anything I can do. And he just wrote name after name after name after name. And he was telling me that as he was writing those names down, like he began to realize man, I have a community of people around me that care about me and, and love me. And that's something I can be thankful for. Right? I, I am blessed with this. And even though it's the midst of a difficult circumstance, and even though he just heard another round of bad news, like he has a community of people that are for him. 
He's not alone in that journey. And it's just another reminder of the way that God is working in his life. And he just talked about how like that reset his brain and helped him think differently and didn't go into those negative thought cycles and didn't head into that um, depressed state that's so easy to get into. Gratitude has that power to, to reset our brain, to give us a new perspective, to help us see things that maybe we can't see in the moment. It's a powerful practice. It's not just a response to something when something good happens. It's not just being polite. It's a powerful practice that God gives us to help us be aware of his presence with us. The Lord is near. And when I talk about gratitude, I want to be clear that we're not talking about like toxic positivity, right? Where like the house is burning down and you're sitting with a cup of coffee. You're like, everything's fine. Life's great. It's good. Right, because sometimes I think we get that message that, oh, to be a Christian, I gotta be positive all the time. I gotta just like, everything's great and the Lord bless you and God's good, right? And, and that's like toxic positivity when you ignore the reality going on around you. It's, it's a defense mechanism to not experience those negative emotions. Biblical gratitude is big enough to hold all of that together, even the difficult circumstances you face. So it's not ignoring that, it's acknowledging that, but it's also realizing that maybe there's realities that I can't see. That even in the midst of those challenging circumstances, God is with me and he's working on my behalf and he is for me. So gratitude is a powerful tool, a powerful practice to help you see that. Another powerful practice that I wanna talk about is the practice of lament. Now, lament is kind of a foreign idea to our American culture, but lament is a, it's a, a prayer practice where you just call out and acknowledge all of the difficulties of the circumstances that you're in, where you express your grief, your sorrow, your anger, your frustration to God, right? You, you call it out, you, you're honest and, and real and raw, and like, God, it shouldn't be this way. God, why won't you do something? God, fix this situation. This isn't right, and it's a prayer practice that, that acknowledges, it deals with the difficult circumstances we're facing and, and you, you give that to God as you express what's going on inside of your heart and your mind, being real and raw and honest. And I know that sounds a little bit like the opposite of gratitude. Hey, wait a minute, Bray, you just told us to have gratitude and now you're telling us to focus on all the bad stuff going on in our life? Didn't Luke talk like last week about the danger of grumbling and how we should have gratitude instead of grumbling? Grumbling is just, it's just you, right? You, you cycle through again and again and again and, and all the bad things and you just get negative and bitter and cynical. Lament is acknowledging the truth of the situation. This stinks. This shouldn't be this way. This isn't right. But you're acknowledging that to God. You're giving it to God. And there's something powerful that happens as you lament. It begins to free you up to see more of reality than just your difficult circumstance. It actually opens you up to see the truth that God is with you in the midst of that difficult circumstance, in the midst of that grief, in those challenges, God is with you. And so um, lament is one of those things that we don't talk about often in our American culture. Um, it doesn't fit on a coffee mug or the, you know, the signs that you hang in your house about God, right? Like we like to say, focus on all the positive things. But it is a powerful practice that I found in my life is, is so helpful and it acknowledges the truth of what you're facing. It doesn't minimize it, it doesn't ignore it, it doesn't diminish it, but it, you're able to face it and deal with it as you express that to God. So I, I wanna take a look um, at a Psalm of Lament. And the, the book of Psalms in our Old Testament is a collection of um, ancient songs and poems um, that was marked the, the way that the ancient Jewish people worshiped. And um, of the Psalms, the book of Psalms, in general, there's like three different types of Psalms. There's subcategories and different types, but it brought over you three different types. There's Psalms of praise, Psalms of thanksgiving, which is great for gratitude, um, and then there's Psalms of lament. Now, what's interesting is that in all the Psalms, the three different types, there are more Psalms of lament than the other two types. So that means for the ancient Jewish people, Lament marked their expression of worship. They had tools and practices to help them express the difficult circumstances and give that to God. And I think it's something that is gonna be helpful 
um, to us today. And so I want to look at a psalm of lament. This is a, a psalm from David, Psalm 13. And as we read through this psalm, I want you to pay attention to a couple of things. One, I want you to notice the real honest language that David uses as he prays to God. And then two, I want you to pay attention for the moment of perspective shift, all right? Psalm 13, David starts out. He says, O Lord, how long will you forget me? Forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul and sorrow in my heart every day? Maybe you've been there before. Maybe those words are something that you've felt when you're facing those difficult circumstances. God, why won't you do something? Where are you? David goes on. He says, turn and answer me, O Lord, my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat saying we've defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall. But I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. Do you notice the real honest language that David used as he was praying to God? Sometimes we have this misconception that I gotta be polite and reverent and polished and do these certain things for God to listen to me. God just wants your heart. He wants, he wants the real you, whatever you're going through in that moment. God's big enough for your questions. He's big enough for your anger. He's big enough for your frustrations. He's big enough for your grief. He's big enough for your sorrow. You can bring all of that to God, your real, honest, true self. You can express it to God. He wants to hear it. Now, it's easy to read this psalm and think, oh, well, David, like, he's getting, like, really gut level honest with God and then realizes, oh, my gosh, maybe I've offended God. I got to say something nice at the end. So uh, I'll, st I'll still trust you, and I praise you, God, right? Like, like he's trying to cover his bases. I don't, I don't think that's what David's trying to communicate. It, the way I read this, I think David is actually going through the process of lamenting. I think he's writing, he's calling out all of these frustrations, acknowledging the reality that's going on and says, it shouldn't be this way. God, why aren't you doing something? God, move and show up. And I think it's actually the practice of lament that as David is doing this, he's able then to begin to see a reality that he couldn't see when he first started. And as he's giving this to God, he's able to see, oh, wait, God is with me. The Lord is near, and I can still give God praise for that. I think his statements at the end are a perspective shift that the action of lament opened him up to new realities that maybe he couldn't see because all he could see was this difficult circumstance, and now he realizes, oh, God's with me, and God is, God is for me, and he's working on my behalf, and because of that, I can rejoice. Because of that, I can have gratitude. Because of that, I can respond. Lament is a powerful tool that opens us up to realities that maybe we can't see. And I think gratitude and lament go hand in hand because lament helps you deal honestly with the situations you're facing. And some of us are facing really difficult circumstances, and it would not be helpful to ignore or minimize or downplay those. And lament allows you to deal with those, but you express them to God. And then that opens you up to see things. And then the intentional practice of gratitude, to be able to, to call those things out and express your gratitude, opens you up to the truth of God's presence with you, that God is for you. He's with you. He's working on your behalf. Gratitude, lament, they go hand in hand. I think two great practices, two great tools that Scripture gives us to help us realize the truth, the reality of God's presence with us. Gratitude, lament. So as we close, I just I want to share a, a quote I came across. It's from um, a guy named Francis Weller. He's a psychotherapist. And I don't think he's necessarily writing this from a Christian perspective. But when I came across it, I thought, man, this is truth. <laughs> this is what I'm trying to communicate. And he says it way better than, than what I could. So I want to just leave you with, with this thought. He says, um, the work of a mature person is to carry grief in one hand and gratitude in the other. 
and be stretched large by them. I love that. To be stretched large by them. He says, how much sorrow can I hold? That's how much gratitude I can give. If I only give grief, I'll bend towards cynicism and despair. He says, if I only have gratitude, I'll become saccharine and won't develop much compassion for other people's suffering. Grief keeps the heart fluid and soft, which helps make compassion possible. Gratitude, lament. And this is what I love about the reality of of what this is talking about. This is real life. Life's not black and white. Life's, Life's messy. And mixed all together are moments of sorrow and moments of joy. Mixed all together in life are are moments of happiness and and moments of worry and anxiety. Mixed all together in life, there's 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 peace and then there's like frustration and anger. Like it's it's that's life. It's all mixed together. And these two practices give us the ability to deal with the reality of life, to call out the things that shouldn't be, the injustices of the world, the difficulties you face, the grief and sorrow in your heart, but you give it to God but then also to be able to to call out and say, there's things in life that maybe I'm missing, that God is still good, he is with me, that there's things I can give gratitude for. And you hold those together. And when you hold both of those, you're gonna be stretched large by them. It's gonna grow you. It's gonna mature you in your faith. And those two practices, I think are vital for helping us take our next step with Christ. So as we close here, I, I invite you into kind of a, just a moment of prayer and reflection. So if you would just close your eyes, wherever you are, I invite you to take a deep breath. And I invite you to hold both hands out in front of you. And I want you to imagine in one hand is all of the, the difficult circumstances you face whatever it is in your life, whatever you're going through, whatever is weighing heavy on your heart, just imagine that you're holding that in one of your hands. And in the other hand, I want you to imagine the things that you can have gratitude for, uh, the blessings, the way that God is with you, the the realities that maybe you can't see. Take a moment to, to think about that and you're holding all of that in your other hand. And now just imagine yourself lifting your hands, both of those, the difficult circumstances and your gratitude, you're lifting it up to God. Lament and gratitude. And you're inviting Jesus into the moment, the complexities of everything that is the reality of your life. Jesus wants it all. So Jesus, we invite you into each of our lives this morning. God, we acknowledge the things in our life that weigh heavy on our hearts that shouldn't be this way. God, we ask you to open our eyes to the reality that you are with us. The Lord is near. God, at the same time, we don't want to be stuck in our despair. There's beauty around us that maybe we can't see. So God, we we invite you in to open our eyes to things that we can give gratitude for, to be thankful. And God, help us live in the tension of both of those worlds. As we we get stretched wide by those, God, we invite you to, to continue to shape us and form us into the people that you've called us to be. But above all, we invite you into our hearts, into our lives, into every situation, good and bad, beautiful and ugly, You want it all. Jesus, thank you for the promise that you are near. And God, thank you for the promise that then your peace is available to every one of us. It's a peace that passes all understanding and it can guard our hearts and our minds in you. Jesus, we give all these things to you. We pray them all in your name, in Jesus' name.